car. The kids started school this week. They actually went back yesterday, but because I'm in Davis County, we have the hybrid schedule. So they're only in school two days a week. So today they're home. <laughs> so here I am. I guess I can say the pros with the hybrid schedule are that they have smaller classes. So not only are the classes really small, but the desks are spread pretty far apart. So they have no one to distract them because nobody's talking to them. So they don't get into trouble and they're definitely paying attention. All right, so let's talk about some updates since the last video message. In the last video, I talked about the October 31st full moon. And a friend of mine pointed out to me afterwards that there's actually two full moons in October, which is significant. There's a full moon on the first day of the month and a full moon on the last day of the month. So we have the harvest moon and the hunter moon. Well, when you think about scriptures, what comes to mind when you think about the words harvest and hunter? I think harvest, we're all pretty much on the same page with that. And with the word hunter, what comes to mind for me, in the Old Testament, Jeremiah made this prophecy. He said, Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. Initially with missionary work, missionaries or evangelism is like being a fisherman. You go out and you gather in all the fish. You put out the bait and the fish come to you. But in the very last of the last days, instead of being fishermen, we become like hunters. When you think about a hunter, the hunter is going after one animal at a time. It involves a lot more work just for one animal. Where with fishing, you can even throw out a net and fill it with fish. I remember one time I went fishing with my dad about 10 years ago, and within one hour, we each had caught eight fish. The fish were really biting good that day. So that's what I think of when I think of fishing. But I can't tell you how many times as a child, my dad would come home from the deer hunt with nothing. <laughs> He came home empty-handed so many times over the years. Fishing, you just go out for an hour or two and you come home with a couple of fish. Hunting, you can go out for a whole weekend or a whole week and come home with nothing. And where hunting in the scriptures has a reference to missionary work, it's interesting because so does the harvest. Anyways, I'd love to hear from you if you have any thoughts about that, but I think it's definitely significant. October is a month to pay attention to. October 3rd is the day of General Conference, and it's also the day that Sekot begins, otherwise known as the Feast of Tabernacles, which is also known as the Harvest Festival or the Festival of Ingathering. But isn't it fascinating to see those words? There they are, gathering, harvest. And during this feast, the Israelites were commanded to perform a pilgrimage to the temple. So I kind of got excited and thought, well, maybe there's going to be some connection here. Maybe during General Conference, there will be an announcement about the temples, um, something to do with the harvest, missionary work, the gathering. So definitely something to pay attention to. And this begins two days after the harvest moon. Now in the last video message, I talked about marriages. And I talked about the month of October, Halloween, that pastor's dream, where there just seems to be this pattern of attacks on marriage. Anyways, so some friends of mine sent this in to me and so that I could share it in my video. He said, we had an object lesson this morning that I thought was worth sharing. We had a poplar tree that is relatively tall but does not have a strong base yet because it's young that was snapped off the base in a strong windstorm last night. This tree was basically two trees growing together. As you can see, here's the picture. Growing together from the same base, kind of like a husband and wife. When the strong winds and the thunderstorm came, one of them fell. But interestingly enough, 
was caught by a neighboring tree and didn't hit the ground. It's interesting because this weekend I'm planning on helping my mother move as she's planning on getting divorced. I also have two friends which are having marital problems and one set of friends posted this morning that they were separated. I also have a cousin and two of her children which would be second cousins, who are both going through divorce at this time. So it's definitely rampant in my world. I definitely feel that Satan has been attacking marriages and families with everything that he's got. And this is definitely a metaphor for what's going on in the spiritual realm. So his experience was another witness to what I shared in the last video message. As I always say, I feel like it's been my personal experience that things that happen all around us that we can see with our physical eyes, things that happen in the physical, are most often symbolic manifestations of what's happening in the spiritual with that ongoing war of evil versus righteousness. Satan's kingdom against God's kingdom. And again, I really believe that that's one of Satan's biggest strategies right now is to go after husbands and wives, to attack marriages, to split the family. Now in the last video, I also talked about trees in my yard and the things that I was noticing with the trees and the bugs and the diseases and how I felt that that was symbolic of Satan attacking the family because trees represent families. And so my friend reached out to me and shared with me his experience with trees, but then another person reached out to me and shared with me a dream that her daughter had about trees. She said, when I listened to your video, I couldn't believe it because it reminded me so much of my daughter's dream and she gave me permission to share it as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and read that to you. Her daughter had this dream on July 14th of this year. I'm just gonna read it. I'll have links to all this down below if you wanna check it out. I've posted a lot of this over on my blog. Okay, she says, I believe God can communicate through dreams. This has been a blessing in my life and my children's lives. Most dreams from God for our family have been helpful on a personal level. And although we record them, they are held close and not shared unless directed by the Spirit. The following is one that both my daughter and I felt from the start should be shared. We encourage you to seek guidance from God for insight as to what he would want you to learn from this dream and what actions he would have you take. My 16-year-old daughter came to me Monday morning, June 29th, 2020, to share a dream that she had had the previous night. It came after a few nights of me specifically praying to the Lord to know how the chaos in the world, which appears to be increasing in volume and variety, would affect my family and what I should be doing to prepare. She said that during her dream, we as a family were in our current house here in West Haven, Northern Utah. On the TV came an emergency broadcast system report stating that there was a swarm of bugs coming that were eating everything and it recommended finding shelter. These bugs were small, like the size of a pinky fingernail. They sucked the fluid of the plants, which made the plants die, just like what's happening on my trees. So they sucked the fluid of the plants, which made the plants die or partially die, so that they grew tall, but plants like grain did not develop their seeds on top and couldn't be harvested. There's that word again, harvest. Then another wave of bugs would come through and suck dry what the first bugs didn't kill completely. These bugs did not bite humans, but were eating more than their typical diet of grains and grasses. From the time of the alert on the TV to the time that the bugs arrived at our house, was about 30 minutes. Our family understood that we had to provide a path for the bugs to travel through our home or they would find ways to get in and not leave. So the front door and the back door were opened. We also knew that the cleaner that the house was, the less the bugs stayed because if there wasn't food for them to eat and there were less places to hide, they would travel through. We quickly stripped the beds of linen, 
Also in preparation of the bugs coming, we carried our food storage down to the crawl space of our home because our door down there is flush with the floor and they would just crawl right over it. They were attracted to exploring any space indoors that they could crawl in. As we sat as a family in the crawl space waiting for the approach of the swarm, our 14-year-old son remembered that we had left our airtight containers of food and jars of canned foods upstairs and wanted to retrieve them. But my husband told him to leave the containers upstairs because they would be protected from the bugs. After the wave of bugs traveled through the house, we went back upstairs. The food in the fridge had been mostly eaten and we had to wipe the bugs off the containers. Any food not in a sealed, airtight container was devoured. There was a half of a watermelon left on the counter covered by plastic wrap, which the bugs had completely eaten except for the rind, which had been sucked dry. Because our house had been very clean and everything stored in airtight containers, we just had a few hundred stragglers. We swept them off the walls into a garbage can and then we drowned them. My daughter remembers picking one up and examining it. She noted the markings of its exoskeleton and she turned it over and saw that the belly of the bugs were gorged. She understood that there was something wrong with these bugs genetically because their instinct to stop eating when full was gone. They consumed food not typical to their diet. The exoskeleton would explode from eating too much and they would die. She said that during this plague, people would periodically pick up the bugs and examine their markings to see which type of bug was passing through, as each variety did different types of damage to the crops. After the bugs came through, everyone's lawns were dead. She then saw extended families of farmers, grandparents to small children, and neighbors standing around large fields of grain spraying pesticides at the bugs as they arrived. But it was mostly futile as there were so many bugs. When my daughter awoke from the dream in the morning, she went out to feed her pig and tried to say the name over and over so she could remember to look it up. She was told in her dream that the name of the bug was the chinch bug, but she could only remember chit bug. When she searched for that on Google, it came up with a suggestion, do you mean chinch bug? With the exact picture of the bug she remembers picking up and examining closely in her dream. She assured me that she has never heard of the word chinch before and has never heard of the chinch bug. As she read about it on Wikipedia after her dream, she learned it is in fact a very small bug and is classified as a true bug. Here's the definition that she found on the Wikipedia. Blissus leucopterus feed on plants, both wild and cultivated, belonging to the grass family, such as wheat, rye, barley, oats, and corn. Well, right as I read this, I saw in my mind this image. This is a chart of the harvests in Israel. And as you can see, wheat, barley, and oats are at the top of the chart. They're harvested in April and May, so spring. And it got me thinking if this dream could be pointing towards something next spring, spring of 2021, involving the Lord's harvest. And again, when we see things happen in the physical, it's always a manifestation to me of what's taking place in the spiritual. It reminded me of the Passover, being safely gathered in your homes under the protection of the Lord as the destroying angel passes through, passes by. Well, Passover of 2021 begins March 27th and ends on Saturday, April 3rd, the same day of General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This very much stands out to me. And right as I had this thought and I was editing this video, here's the number that I saw on my screen. 311, the number that I always see, my pay attention number. Remember, it was on 311 of this year, March 11th, that the country shut down. That was the day when coronavirus was officially in our country and everything changed and has never been the same since. They suck the sap out of the growing plants. When the plants ripen or become dry, 
they travel to other growing plants to feed. The chinch bug, a native to the United States and common in the Midwestern states, has had a great effect on agriculture. The chinch bug naturally feeds on wild prairie grass. As the Midwestern states were settled in the 19th century and crops of wheat, corn, sorghum, and other grains were planted, they adapted well to these new species as habitat and food species. Throughout the 20th century, the chinch bug was a major pest to farmers as it quickly decimated corn or wheat fields. To deal with this problem, many farmers in the area changed their crops to soybeans, which were not a host to the chinch bug. This led to a huge decrease in the chinch bug population in this area. Today, they are mostly a common lawn pest and are commonly treated with pesticides and pest resistant grasses. She said, I believe that this is a warning dream from God. I believe the dream was sent to my daughter because she is without guile. She's been blessed with dreams over the years and this one is a direct answer to my prayers. I personally feel a strong urge to prepare for a time of possible famine in the future. To safeguard my food storage in airtight containers, ready my home by organizing and decluttering, and prepare my family spiritually. I also feel a strong desire to share my testimony of this warning with others quickly, including my family and neighbors. My daughter and I do not know the time frame of this dream, but our feeling to prepare is urgent, and it's important that I share this message promptly. My daughter and I believe that this dream has spiritual and physical components. Spiritually, the chinch bugs could represent the evils of the world, and although they may find a way into our home, the better prepared we are with spiritual armor and provide a door for the quick exit, the damage and cleanup will be minimal. Today, my daughter said that there is greater power in spiritual preparation than in physical preparation. There is no need to fear or panic but to take whatever forms of preparation God directs you in seriously. I'm sure our family will be learning more from this dream as we study and pray for insights to be taught by the Spirit. But last night I had a very strong impression that this message needed to be shared quickly without delay. As I stated at the beginning, I plead with whoever reads this to ponder on it and ask God what he would have you understand from this dream. Then record your impressions and act accordingly. Then she wrote, a couple days after this dream, I read the words, Diatomaceous Earth, and had the thought to research whether or not it could protect against the chinch bugs. And from what I read, I discovered that it could. Diatomaceous Earth can also be used to control chinch bugs. Diatomaceous Earth is an insecticidal dust which acts as an abrasive. It cuts the outer layer of the chinch bug's body, causing it to dehydrate and then die. Anyways, so here's a picture of what the chinch bug looks like. So when I wrote her back, I said, that is so fascinating because a couple of months ago, I received an email from my lawn care company, and in the email it said that they have been seeing something called the chinch bug increasing in population in this area that I live in. I also live in Northern Utah. This was also a bug that I have never heard of before. And it showed a picture and it said that the chinch bug was causing all of these dead spots on people's lawns. And most people think, well, it's just a lack of water, but it's actually the chinch bug sucking the grass dry. So it was pretty crazy that I had just learned about this bug myself from an email from my lawn service company telling me this was a growing problem in our area. And then someone reached out to me and shared with me a dream about this very bug. So again, as I always say, when you notice patterns in your life, pay attention. There's always a message attached. Okay, and speaking of dreams, I had a dream the other night. I don't have dreams that I remember very often, so when I do, I pay attention. And this dream had nothing to do with anything that I had been thinking about, pondering about, or praying about. So it's one thing to pray about something. Oh, that's so funny, it's 1.44 p.m. right now on my clock, right as I said that. There's that pay attention number, 144. Anyways, it's one thing to pray about something and then get a direct response to that prayer through a dream like she did. And it's another thing to have a dream just come completely out of left field that seems to have a power 
powerful message, but it's not something that you were asking about or praying or pondering about. So let me tell you about this dream. I was sitting in church and it looked like a Sunday school room type of setting. And there were some leaders sitting up on the front row and I believe the man that got up to speak was from the stake. So it was a stake leader who got up to speak to us. And right before he started speaking, he said, I want all the sisters in the room to please stand. So all the sisters in the room stood up. And then he said, I want you to move and sit on the right side of your husbands. So all these sisters shifted around so that they were all sitting on the right side of their husbands. Then he went on to say this. He said, sorry, the jets are flying over right now. <laughs> it's pretty loud. But he said, the direction that we're going right now in the church is to follow the pattern or the way that things are in heaven. He said in heaven and in the eternities, husbands and wives rule and reign together as one. And he said, up until now in the church, we've all been doing our own separate things. We all have our own separate auxiliaries and our own separate callings. And you know, your wife is off over here serving in this capacity. You're off over here serving in that capacity. And he said, no, not anymore. We need to be more unified as a church. And in order to unify families and to unify the church, we need to unify the husband and wife. And so we're going to start having husbands and wives minister together and serve together in their capacities and callings. And I remember at that point, I started to tune out what he was saying because my mind went to all the possibilities that this could mean. And then I woke up. But I remember in my mind, I, I wondered, does this mean that we're getting rid of these different auxiliaries? Are we just gonna all be one? So instead of having Relief Society and Young Women's, everyone's just together. We're in this together, we're serving together because time is short and we really have to come together and work together. I also saw in my mind a picture of the first presidency and instead of it being the traditional photo of the president and his two counselors, it was a photo that included their wives. And I thought how neat would that be to have their wives serving alongside them and, and helping and working as partners, the husbands consulting their wives as they serve together for the same purpose. And in my dream, it was very clear that, yeah, that's how it is in heaven. That's how it is in the eternities. Husbands and wives rule and reign together as one. They're very united. Anyways, it was a pretty short dream. That was it. And when I woke up, I thought, wow, that is so interesting. It's interesting that here was a dream about strengthening husbands and wives and strengthening marriages and strengthening the church amidst a time when we can see that Satan is blatantly attacking marriages and attacking the families to weaken the church. So I don't know if that dream was just symbolic or if it is a dream of things to come. Anyways, I just remember feeling pretty excited when I woke up. It was just such a good feeling. And I remember in my dream when he was announcing all of this and trying to teach us, I was so excited. And I turned to my husband and I said, yes, yes, this is so right. I knew this day would eventually come. <laughs> I remember saying that to my husband as I got up and moved over to the right side of him. <laughs> I think of in the scriptures when it talks about being found at the right hand of God, being found on the right side of the Lord, that always represents righteousness. So being on the right side of your husband, to me, represents righteousness within a marriage. So just something to ponder. So again, speaking of dreams, this morning, my daughter, when she woke up, told me that she had had this dream last night. She never talks to me about her dreams. It's very, very rare. And she told me it was a very short dream and she drew a picture of it. And as you can see at the top of the paper, she said, I saw a rock and I saw a boulder. So she was looking down, she sees this rock and then she sees this giant boulder. Then further down the page, you can see that the rock breaks up into pieces. She said the rock just turned into all these smaller rocks that just started breaking down and joining with the boulder and it started to grow. And she said at this point, she was elevated up into the atmosphere, so she was looking down with an aerial view onto the earth, so she could see the continents and she could see the clouds moving over them. 
and she said she saw everything starting to come together. She saw a wooden spoon, a giant wooden spoon. You can see she drew it off to the side. It's that red looking spoon. She saw a giant wooden spoon that started stirring up water, little bodies of water within the continents. And as that water started swirling, everything started changing. So as you look at this drawing that she did, where the red border line is around that piece of land, the reason she drew a border was because it was all covered with clouds. So she understood that everything had formed together to create what she said was Pangaea, all the continents coming back together. But because of the clouds that were moving around, she was only able to see patches of it. So she drew this little patch of land that she saw, and she could still see that wooden spoon swirling the water. That's why she colored it blue. But she could see brown and green and, you know, the trees and the mountains. And she just said that was pretty much it. That was her dream was these rocks breaking up, forming together with giant boulders, and then water being swirled and set into motion and this momentum happening and all the continents coming back together. Now this is something that she has not been talking about and I haven't been talking about. None of us have been talking about or pondering this at all. So for her to have this dream was pretty significant. So we're definitely paying attention. Could this dream be letting her know that we're not too far from this event? It could be happening sooner than we think. The hurricanes that we're seeing right now look like someone's taken a giant wooden spoon and swirled the ocean to get it into that momentum. And with all the earthquakes that have been happening the last couple of weeks, a lot of news articles are saying there's this connection between the earthquakes, you know, the activity of the earth moving, and the weather, the hurricanes, that the two go hand in hand. I found this article on ldsliving.com that's titled, Three Things That Will Happen to the Earth at the Second Coming. This is a great reminder. The first thing that will happen is the earth will be burned. It says, first, the scriptures tell us that the earth will be burned to a crisp when he comes again. Christ himself will burn the earth. Christ is a celestial being, and we often compare the glory of celestial beings to the sun. It's hot already in the middle of July, but imagine if the sun got any closer to the earth. It wouldn't be long before the earth would be in flames. Number two, the continents will return to their original positions. Another thing that will happen to the earth is that all the land masses will come together into one. When Christ stands on the Mount of Olives, there will be an earthquake, the likes of which the world has never known. The oceans will gather into one place. The land will become one. It'll be cool. You'll be able to drive to Japan, England, or Hawaii. All countries and continents will come together and be united in preparation for the Lord to be their king. And we read in Doctrine and Covenants, section 133, verses 23 through 24, He shall command the great deep, and it shall be driven back into the north countries. And the island shall become one land, and the land of Jerusalem and the land of Zion shall be turned back into their own place. And the earth shall be like as it was in the days before it was divided. So it will be what we call Pangaea. And number three, the earth will receive its paradisical glory. But what good is having the land masses come together if they're nothing but a massive charred chunk of land that looks like craters of the moon or hell's half acre. Doesn't seem very pleasant, does it? Thankfully, we have church doctrine to help us understand the third thing that will happen when Christ comes. The tenth article of faith says that the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisical glory. The word paradisical contains the word paradise. That sounds a lot better than hell's half acre. The earth was created in a new or paradisical state. Then, incident to Adam's transgression, it fell to its present telestial state. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, At the second coming of our Lord, it will be renewed, regenerated, refreshed, transfigured, become again a new earth, a paradisical earth. Its millennial status will be a return to its pristine state of beauty and glory, the state that existed before the fall. 
Can you imagine living in a place like the Garden of Eden? I can hardly wait to experience that new world when Christ comes. Those weren't my own words, by the way. That was me reading the article. Now in the last video message, I talked about that protection that we receive through our covenants in the temple. I talked about the endowment ordinance. I talked about the initiatory and the endowment. Um, and I talked about our temple garments and the real protection, not just physical, but spiritual protection that they bring. Someone shared this today with me and I just wanna share with you a recent real experience of the temple garments being a protection for some sister missionaries. Hi everyone, for those of you who don't know, and even for those of you that do know, I'd like to talk about the sisters that got stabbed in my mission. They are my friends. I was training with one of them in my first area for about five months. I know her very, very well, and this has been so hard, just hard. I cannot express the pain this has brought me, other missionaries, and both of those sisters and their families. It sounds so foreign and distant until it happens to a friend, or a brother, or a sister, or a daughter. It's very, very real now. I'll say what I know, though, for the express reason that it has built my faith completely, and my faith in the Savior has only increased because of this trial. So the sisters were stabbed in the middle of the night by an invader inside their apartment. The man came in at 4 a.m., removing his shoes to be quieter, and grabbed a knife out of their kitchen. Then he walked into their bedroom and started stabbing both sisters. Both sisters had to go to the hospital because each was stabbed multiple times and were in the ICU for about a week, and now both are returning home from their missions to heal where they may or may not return to missionary service. Now let me talk about some of the miracles involved, though. First, neither sister was stabbed anywhere their garments covered. It was not touched. One sister did have her garment shirt rolled up in the night, and she was stabbed in her side. Second, after their parents were notified, their fathers were there three hours after the stabbing. Third, the sister that got stabbed in her side was stabbed in her hands and her feet as well. One hand was stabbed completely through to the other side. In a very, very literal way, she now has wounds in her hands, feet, and side to match the Savior's. The same sister shared her testimony about how she feels closer to her Savior than ever before. She feels like she was given this so she could more fully witness of the suffering the Savior had to go through for each of us. She told us all that she had completely forgiven her attacker, and she was grateful for the miracle that both sisters had been given. Her wound in her side was really bad, but she shared with us that in her setting apart blessing, she was blessed that if she was obedient and kept the commandments, she would be safe, and even the very organs of her body would be kept safe. She told us that if the knife in her side had turned one way or the other in any direction, she would have bled to death, and they wouldn't have been able to save her. Fourth, when the sisters were being attacked, they tried to fight back against him, and they prayed. Both sisters remembered praying, but the Hermana that I was friends with recalled saying a prayer, and as soon as she finished, she made eye contact with her attacker and said, Stop right now and leave this apartment. After she said that, the attacker dropped the knife, turned around, and walked out of the apartment. I witnessed that the power of the ministering of angels is real, and the priesthood power is just as accessible by women acting in faith and righteousness as it is to any worthy man that holds the priesthood. Fifth, when our mission president heard that the sisters were in the hospital, he knew he needed to get there as soon as he possibly could. He called an STL in their apartment complex and asked her to talk with the police and find out which hospital they were admitted to. But since time was of the essence, he and his wife prayed together, got in the car, picked a direction, and started driving, not knowing beforehand where they needed to go. When they got the address to the hospital, they were only two minutes away. Brothers and sisters, I know that these things could only have happened by the power of God. There is no other possible explanation. 
and I'm so glad to be in a place where I can witness these things and bring them to you. I testify to each of you that the Lord will make good on his promise, and he will always consecrate thine afflictions for thy good. I know that it does not matter where you are, and it does not matter who you are. It does not matter what the circumstance is. It does not matter if you think you have fallen out of the reach of God, because you haven't. It does not matter if you think that miracles only come sometimes, and God is more subtle than bold and real. It does not matter if you think God is punishing you for some misdeed. It does not matter. I promise you that God will act boldly, and He does. God has said, Behold, I am God, and I am a God of miracles, and I will show unto the world that I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I work not among the children of men, save it be according to their faith. If you think miracles won't come, then they won't. If you say, Well, that's a cool story, but it doesn't always happen like that then it definitely won't to you. There's a reason Jesus could not do miracles in Nazareth. I know God is real, and He will bring us unto Him. And no matter who you are, He will protect you. He will love you, and you will always be safe from harm as long as you faithfully look to Him to rescue you. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. I read in the news story that mentioned that they caught the attacker, and when they asked him why he did it, he said he didn't know why and that he felt really bad about it because he knew that they were good girls. And so I truly believe that he was under the influence of the adversary. He was under that demonic control and that's why he has no idea why he did that. But anyways, it just goes along perfectly with what I talked about in my last video message. But I talked about the spiritual protection of what were promised in the temple. How those temple garments are to be a shield to us, to protect us from the very powers of hell. So that's all for updates. Let's move along to current events. So today, right now, Hurricane Lara is about to make landfall, and they just said today that it's been bumped up to a Category 4 status. Um, I also read that it's possible it could create up to 30 miles of surge inland, so we could have water reaching as far as 30 miles onto land, and that this could be just as devastating as Hurricane Katrina. So my friends and I were having a chat about all the earthquakes and crazy things going on with the weather. And one of my friends wrote and said, oh wow you guys, three storms? And she showed this screenshot of the three storms headed towards the US. You had the two tropical storms slash hurricanes heading towards the Gulf Coast, and then you had the one headed towards the West Coast. She wrote, the bottom left one is headed to the fires in Northern California. When I showed my mom the projected hurricane headed her way, she's an hour outside of Houston, her response was, good, we are desperate for rain. So maybe some of this will be a blessing. And she wrote, look where all the fires are, exactly where all three hurricanes are heading. She wrote, in the video I watched on it yesterday from the Weather Channel, they were only able to show two other times that this had happened. Two hurricanes hitting the coast at the same time. It's very rare. She said it's breaking the record to have these two hit. Record has been five before August ended back in 1886 and 1916. And now we'll have seven this year before August. So it's already a year of breaking records. And then she started to talk about the names and she said the one that's headed toward Texas is Marco. It's hurricane number 14. And the meaning of the name Marco means warlike or war. And the other one, hurricane 13, headed to Florida is Hurricane Lara, which means victory. So interesting, you have two hurricanes that were looking like they were going to hit at the same time, one meaning war, the other meaning victory. She said that's very interesting that war and victory are hitting at the same time. Any impressions with that? So I wrote, hmm, maybe war with Texas and victory with Florida? She said, or maybe war and victory hitting at the same time. 
maybe not specific to those places, but maybe they happen together. Well, I went to bed and then the next morning I woke up and the very first thing I see on my phone is a Twitter alert that says this. What could possibly go wrong? Again, the attacks on Florida and Texas are getting ridiculous. Notice the timing in the midst of chaos. And then this person tagged at Governor Ron DeSantis and at Senator Rick Scott. Attached to that tweet was a link to this article that says, 750 million genetically engineered mosquitoes approved for release in the Florida Keys. Now the article didn't say what these mosquitoes have been engineered to do. So I brought this up to my friend and she replied, the mosquitoes being released are all male and programmed to not reproduce. So sterile males. They kill the mosquitoes that carry some of the diseases. I remember them talking about the concept back when that Zika virus came out a few years back. They kill off the disease-carrying mosquitoes. Also, males don't bite humans. It's only the females that do, so it sounds like a good thing. Anyways, I don't know much more about that story, but I just found it interesting that I had just said the night before that maybe these two hurricanes represent war and victory with Texas and Florida. And my friend said, yeah, probably even at the same time. And then in the morning I wake up and see this tweet. It's the very first thing at the top of my phone that references attacks specifically on Texas and Florida. So something to pay attention to. Speaking of war on Texas and victory in Florida, I woke up this morning to hear something on the radio that really stood out to me and had everything to do with what we're talking about. So it was on the Glenn Beck radio program, and he had a guest on, and they were talking about the Black Lives Matter curriculum coming into all the schools, public schools, private schools, you name it. And he talked about a lot of the things that they're introducing to the children, clear down to preschool level. One of the main points he brought up was that they're teaching the children what the definition of a family is. And part of this definition is to teach that it's not just about your family that you live with, but we have these villages and these villages can raise you. You can have people who don't live with you at home who are actually sort of in charge of you and raising you and teaching you. So taking away the role and rights of the parents. The documents for the curriculum of this education have been leaked and I have the links down below. But here's just some of the things that they're teaching the children. They have these activities that you can do with your students to help explore these topics. And this one here says exploring gender stereotypes with role plays. They have games and videos and books all geared at teaching children about what the family really is and what gender identity really is according to their definition. So it's a lot of indoctrination that goes against Judeo-Christian values. And in addition to all the LGBTQ stuff, this curriculum really pushes for learning about social injustice and how to protest. And these kids do practice marches and practice protesting and they design their own posters. And so it's really ingrained into them that everything that Black Lives Matter is doing today that's what they want to teach these children how to do so that by the time they leave high school, there's a whole generation of Americans that will have been radically transformed. Here's just a couple of bullet points from the curriculum. They have transgender affirming and it says everybody has the right to choose their own gender by listening to their own heart and mind. Everyone gets to choose if they are a girl or a boy or both or neither or something else and no one else gets to choose for them. So we're not taught to listen to the will of God, we're taught to listen to our own will. And then this one, queer affirming, everybody has the right to choose who they love and the kind of family they want by listening to their own heart and mind. Now Glenn was talking about how there are schools in Texas that already are implementing this curriculum, as well as many other states across the country. And he was interviewing the Secretary of Education, and she said that there is a county in Florida where there's an increasing number of parents who are now homeschooling. And it's a huge chunk of the population, so she's very impressed with Florida. And so I thought about that victory in Florida. 
and then war on Texas, as Glenn was talking about the schools in Texas who were going this route. And I would like to see, if anybody has it out there, could put something together, I would like to see a map of the whole nation with highlighted areas in the country where schools have already implemented this curriculum. I'd like to know if it's in any of the schools in Utah. So if anybody out there has any information, I'd love for you to share that with me. But, you know, I just have this feeling where they want this to be ingrained in all the children in America. They know that they can't get to the kids who are being homeschooled. As I said, it's in public schools and it's in private schools. But they can't necessarily get to the kids who are being homeschooled. So I could see them looking into getting rid of homeschooling and making that no longer an option here in America. Um, it's not an option in Germany. It's illegal to homeschool your kids. And you think, why would that be? Well, the only reason that I can think of is because they can't indoctrinate your children if you're the one educating them. Now, it's funny that Marco sort of weakened and wasn't as powerful as they anticipated it to be. And Marco represents war. And then Lara is actually increasing and has been bumped up to a category four hurricane and is about to hit landfall right now. Lara represents victory. So sometimes we just focus on the war and we become overwhelmed and fearful of the war itself. But according to this, if you look at it symbolically, it's telling us that the war war is insignificant compared to the victory. We need to be focusing on the victory. Maybe God is somehow using this hurricane as a weapon in this war. Even though things seem so bad right now and everything just feels so chaotic, we need to be focusing on the huge victory that's on the horizon. My friend said as she's been following this, some phrases that have stuck out to her right now about this hurricane are, if you stay, may God be with you. If you lived on the Gulf Coast 20 plus years, you've seen lots of storms. This will be the worst yet. This will change the landscaping for many years. Oh, I just felt that. <laughs> I just got my spirit bumps on that. That's a witness that things are changing. God is preparing the earth for the Savior who's coming back very soon. Some other quotes, the storm is supposed to hit at high tide, which will make the storm surge even worse. The storm surge will be unsurvivable. Here are just a few of the numbers that I've seen. Here's some screenshots of all of these numbers that, that she's seeing attached to these news stories. This one's titled, Get Out Now, Monster Category 4 Hurricane, Lara to hit Texas, Louisiana with unsurvivable storm surge. There it is, 1-1. One, one. The number 11, it's the 11th hour. This is something we talk about all the time on this channel. And here is 111, one, one, another number that we've talked about quite a bit on this channel before. To me, it always represents unity. Um, up at the top, you see the 113. One, so just all these pay attention numbers attached to all of these stories. Again, it was the mayor who said to the citizens, if you stay, may God be with you. Here again is 113, and my friend sees the number 44 quite a bit. I know a lot of you do, and so that's another number we've pondered before. I know this year we talked about 4-4, April 4th, around the time that we had general conference. There was a lot of pay attention numbers attached to that. But nonetheless, when you see things that repeat all the time, whether it be numbers or images, when you see things repeat and you see patterns, to me that always says, pay attention, there's a message in this. Pay attention, this is important. So as I'm recording this video, this is happening in real time. I'm sure by the time I'm done with this, as I'm editing through later, I'll be able to add the aftermath in this video and share my thoughts on that. But my prayers are certainly with the people right now on the Gulf Coast. And here's an aerial of some of the aftermath. It's been reported that about 800,000 people are without power right now. Homes and businesses obliterated and a lot of the coastal part of the cities are completely underwater so they've become a part of the sea right now so lots of damage lots more we'll probably find out over the next couple of days and this story right here has been at the top of all of the headlines today this confederate statue that has been around since 1915 and was recently voted on to 
be kept in place, they wanted to take it down, well, Hurricane Lara toppled it over. So if that doesn't make a statement, I don't know what does. In other events this week, um, something that kind of stood out to me was the announcement from the church about the magazines. And they said that the Enzyme magazine is going away. They're no longer going to have the Enzyme. They're just going to have the Liahona and the Friend. And as I thought about that, that word stood out to me, Enzyme, Enzyme. The Enzyme in the scriptures represents the banner on the mountain that the world looks to as they gather in. Could there be some symbolism in the Enzyme being taken down, being no longer? The only reason I would see in my mind that banner representing the gathering we're to gather into being taken down is if time is up, that end time harvest has come to an end and we're now preparing for something new, which is the millennium. And of course, missionary work will continue into the millennium. But could this be symbolic that the gathering prior to the return of the Lord has reached its conclusion or is just about there? I don't know, but that stood out to me. My whole life, the Enzyme magazine has always been a part of our culture. So to have that no longer really stood out to me. Right when I ended that sentence, I was at three minutes and 11 seconds into this video segment. There's my pay attention number. And last in current events, besides everything that's happening in the nation right now, I kind of don't want to talk about that right now in this video. I feel like that's something we always touch on in all of my videos is our national politics. But today I kind of want to stay away from that. But I will say that something is definitely happening in California. As we can see in the physical, here's some screenshots right here. I mean, this seems like something out of a movie. There's been a lot of talk about the San Andreas Fault finally going off, the big ones finally coming. There are things happening on the fault line that haven't happened from what I read since the 1600s. So now that there's activity picking up in that area, that's telling seismologists that something big is about to happen on that fault line. As you can see, here's some of those headlines. USGS warns San Andreas Swarm could put California at risk of big earthquake for over a week. Further down it says, this part of San Andreas is capable of producing earthquakes that are magnitude 7 and above. The USGS said that the last time an earthquake of this size hit this section was over 300 years ago. So that right there screams, pay attention. We've got the fires, the fire nados. This is a record right here, as you can see, a first of its kind, a warning for a fire nado. Then you have what I call the water nados. Oh my goodness, look at this picture right here. This is crazy. This is all in California. You've got all the fires. There's a reminder again that we're in the 11th hour. It's just about midnight. More than 11,000 lightning strikes keep wildfires raging across California. The storms, the lightning. Look at this bolt of lightning right here. I mean, this is crazy. It looks like a root system. It looks like a tree with roots coming out. And then not only that, but look at this right here. This is something I saw. I think it was on the Weather Channel. I was checking out the Weather Channel one day and there was this video. I clicked on it and it's showing this giant black circle just moving around. And a lot of people have commented that it almost looks like a mouth that's talking or some kind of a portal. At first you think, well, maybe that's just a ring of smoke. And other people thought, well, maybe it's a giant swarm of bugs. Whatever this is, it was huge. And so many people saw it, filmed it. This is over the South Bay area in Santa Clara, just not too far from San Francisco. There it is, you can see it moving around and it's floating, it turns, but the crazy thing is, is the circle never breaks. It turns, it spins, it does all kinds of things, but it remains a circle. One news article said this, it says, the freak weather plague in California took a strange twist in the wind this week as a mysterious circle of black smoke wafted over Santa Clara. Shocked residents captured it on video as heavy thunderstorms bombarded the Bay Area. Such a rare phenomenon usually takes place over active volcanoes, which can eject gray or white vortexes of steam and gas, sometimes as wide as 600 feet in diameter. The cause of this black smoke circle remains unknown. However, it was associated with a powerful lightning strike that erupted moments before. 
And then it went on to say, perhaps more troubling for San Francisco football fans, it wafted over Levi Stadium, home of the seemingly doomed 49ers. Okay, we talked about this several videos ago. I think it might have been even last year. This earthquake happened at the 1989 World Series Championship. So it was a Major League Baseball game. And it was called the Candlestick Stadium, which no longer is used. And this earthquake happened live on TV just minutes before the game began. It was October 14th. And there was a lot of damage caused to that area. So they always talk about the infamous earthquake series, this game that was live on TV, and this earthquake broke out that caused major destruction. Here's another one that looks exactly the same that was filmed in Denver, Colorado in 2018. And so there are many of these happening all over the country, but people say they don't know how to explain what they really are. Here's one being filmed over Disneyland in 2016. And with everything happening in California right now, it's clear that the battleground right now is hot in California. Satan wants California. Um, my mom told me the other day, just a few days ago, she called me and told me, she said, I've been looking at buying or building a home. I think it was near the South Jordan area. And she said a few months ago she went and looked at some places and she looked at the prices and felt like it was something she might be able to do. And then a few months later she came back, talked to the same person, the same realtor, and he said, sorry, prices have gone up $30,000 because everybody is suddenly fleeing California. He said, we've had all these people coming in from California just in the last couple of months wanting to get out of there and they're buying all the homes out here. And so because there's such a crazy demand, prices have gone up. And she said, yikes, well now that's kind of outside of my price range. And so that stood out to me that everybody is fleeing California. It's like the final part of that gathering, just like in the scriptures, just like in the Book of Mormon. People are literally fleeing the wicked cities and looking for refuge. So it's intense watching everything that's going on right now. I mean, it's just one thing after another, day after day. It can be overwhelming, just so much happening right now. It is clear that things are not the same and nothing's ever going to go back to being the same as we know it that what we're watching happen right now is a huge transformation of this land and the hearts of the people. Things are drastically changing and they have to to prepare for the Lord's return. Okay, so talking about the year 2020, as we've said before in the past, I always felt that 2020 was the year of the Lord's perfect vision. He's creating something new, he's doing something new, and this is his perfect vision because when we think of 2020, we think of perfect vision. I may have said this in the last video, but again, it keeps coming to mind that now it's really feeling like 2020 is the year that everyone has clear vision, that we're all able to see clearly, no more through foggy lenses, that we're all able to see what's really going on. Everything is clear to us. And I'm feeling that right now. I just got my spirit bumps. I don't know about you, but to me, it feels like everybody is finally getting on the same page. I think about, you know, over the last 10 years, how many times I, I might have pondered something or brought something up or shared something with someone, and they kind of looked at me like, hmm, <laughs> I don't know about that, or I don't believe that, or to me, that's just a crazy conspiracy. Well, yes, they are crazy and they are conspiracies because that's what a conspiracy is. Men and women conspiring to get gain and power. That's the definition of a conspiracy. Now, over the years, it's been made to be a bad term, a term that you don't wanna be associated with, which is funny because in the Book of Mormon, we're taught about conspiracies and conspiring men of the last days. We're living this right now. Well, anyways, these very people who over the last several years have been sort of like, stay away, I don't wanna hear about that, I don't believe in that, right? These very people 
are now reaching out to me and sharing with others conspiracies. They're reaching out to me saying, have you seen this? Watch this video. What are your thoughts about this? Check this out before it's deleted, right? And my point with sharing this is it really feels like that so many of us, just about all of us, are on the same page. We get it. We're seeing things as they really are now. It doesn't matter what the media says anymore. It doesn't matter what we hear when we turn on the radio or the TV or check out social media because we see what's really going on, what's really happening. And I believe that can only be good for the elections. I believe that all of these videos and voices and people that are being censored and banned and shut down, instead of working against the right, it's actually working for the right. Now, speaking of videos that are getting censored and deleted, there's a video that was sent to me this week that really stood out to me, and I just wanted to touch on a few things real quick in that video. The video was a doctor who was talking about the coming vaccines. She talked about the different proposals for the vaccine, and she talked about this micro needle technology where you slap something on your hand, sort of like a bandage, like a band-aid, and then you peel it off, and these little micro needles, sort of like the fangs of a cobra, but micro fangs, puncture your skin and inject the vaccine in such a minimal way that you barely feel it, you barely notice any pain. She talked about how these will be shipped to everyone so you can just order online, it's shipped to your home in a couple of days, and you go ahead and just quickly vaccinate yourself. She talked about how in the vaccine there's modified DNA and modified RNA, but the thing that stood out to me the most was a certain enzyme in this vaccine that has been patented and named the luciferase enzyme. Well, I think that name says it all. She made mention of how the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is attached to all of this. If you look at everything, their foundation is attached to everything connected to this. And it made me think of the video where I talked about the patent for his cryptocurrency, which is connected to this. And the patent number for that is 060606. So you have that pay attention number. Then you have this pay attention name. The number and the name are connected to a patent connected to these people. Now the doctor was saying that because these people own this patent and this luciferase enzyme changes your genome, she said it's very possible that these same people will have ownership of your DNA. She said once you slap it on your hand, you're given an internal ID number and you now become a product of that company. Through this ID, through this technology, they're able to ensure that you've been successfully vaccinated. She said another component of this technology, the self-vaccination, is a component called hydrogel. She said hydrogel was created by DARPA and it consists of nano robots that are like transformers. They can disassemble and reassemble anywhere in your body to do different things. It's a smart technology that can speak to an app on your phone and tell you, hey, you're about to have a heart attack. You need to go check yourself into a hospital or your blood sugar is low or you're pregnant or We've detected early stages of cancer. You need to go be seen. So of course, if you sell it this way to the general public, it sounds like a good thing. Like, wow, through this smart technology, my phone can tell me things about my body as it's happening so that I can know and be aware and get things taken care of. This is a good thing. This is good for my health. But of course, it's not just your phone that has this information. The company has this information about you. And the doctor asked, why would they need to know this information? She said, with this technology, you no longer have privacy and you no longer have freedom. They'll know everything about you. They'll know if you've taken medications, if you have certain substances in your system, if you're nervous about something, they'll be able to monitor your emotions. And as I listened to how this technology works, I thought to myself, well, if this technology can be inside of your body and it can disassemble and reassemble to accomplish certain things in your body and it can permanently change your genome, Who's to say that it's not going to change things about you, your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions? 
who's to say that those can't be hijacked by this technology, that you're no longer you. Someone else is in control of your body. Who's to say that someone couldn't use this technology to activate things in your body that you don't want activated? to trigger things in your body such as cancer or a heart attack. She talked about how this technology has been tested on insects and bugs and how they are able to exterminate an entire species of insects through this technology and how dangerous that is when you try to play the role of God and you decide what species stay on the earth and which ones go. And she said, if they're already doing that with insects, who's to say they wouldn't do that with humans? And they decide which groups of people must go, certain races that must go, conservatives and Christians must go. She referred to this as human 2.0. And she brought up how Bill Gates comes from a family of eugenics. And eugenics is simply population control. So that's his background. That's what he grew up in. That's what he was taught all of his life, is certain populations should be on the earth and others shouldn't. That we need to create the perfect human race. Anyways, as you read about all of this and you observe everything that's going on, you start to see the parallels to everything that we read in the scriptures, especially in the book of Revelation, when it talks about this day that we're living in and it talks about a mark that's gonna be offered to everyone. And if you don't take that mark, they make life very hard for you. You can't go on and function normally. You can't go into a store and buy things. You can't sell things. You don't have the same freedoms as everyone else. And so they really bully you and pressure you into getting this mark so that your life can be somewhat normal, so that you can function, and that those who get the mark lose their soul. Just like with this technology, once it's inside of you, someone else is controlling you. And those who refuse the mark, not only do they get to keep their soul, but they become targets of persecution, even being martyred for doing so. With the talk that I've heard circulating this topic, it really feels like this is gonna be something that's gonna be required. It's gonna be required in the schools. It's gonna be required for work. It's gonna be required to get a driver's license, a passport, to be able to travel. Just like right now, how they're scanning our temperatures when we go into clinics, offices, and stores. It's like we're being prepared for the next step to have your hand scanned to see if you've been vaccinated. Because if you haven't, you can't come in the store, you can't go in the business, you can't be in the public schools because you're putting others at risk. So everything is shut off to you. Where it looks like you've lost all of your freedoms, the truth is getting that mark causes you to lose your true freedom. So just something to think about as I'm seeing all of this happen, it just seems like it's happening so fast. If you would have told me a few years ago that we would be at this point right now, not only in the world, but here in America, I don't know that I would quite believe you. So this is really happening so fast and it's only going to continue momentum until the Lord returns. Now back on the topic of this being a year of clear vision and seeing things as they really are, it's like the sheep clothing has come off of the wolf and we're seeing what's really happening, what's really going on. Speaking of that, I'm still seeing people who are sort of being duped by some of these wolves. There are people who I'm aware of who are keeping things from the public that the public ought to know, whether it be to continue selling books or to bring more customers in to sell more tickets, whatnot. When some of these people have come clean with me and have said, yes, what you're concerned about is true, instead of showing signs of correcting course, these people have said, you know what, at the end of the day, it's all for the cause. And if it's all for the cause, if at the end of the day, everything that you do helps the cause, helps bring souls into the kingdom, then it really doesn't matter how you go about doing that. It really doesn't matter if you're being dishonest or you're leading people to believe things that aren't true. Just look beyond all of that because if you look at the bigger picture, it's all working together for the cause. I've had people actually say that to me as I've confronted them personally about things that really shocked me that I had to distance myself from and could no longer be a part of. And when I heard them say it's for the cause, it makes me think 
whose cause? And when people notice some of these red flags and they bring it up or question it, I've noticed that a lot of these people who are deceptive for the cause smooth talk the people who are questioning. They smooth talk them into assurance that all is well. Don't worry about what's happening. Yes, your concerns are valid and yes, they're true. But look over here, this beautiful green pasture and just focus on that. That's the overall end vision that we have. And if you just look at that, then you won't worry about all of this yucky stuff happening right here. So look away from this eyesore and just focus on that. And I've just seen person after person get smooth talked into just accepting the deceptions and into just thinking that, you know what, they're right. This is okay because at the end of the day, it's all for the cause and that's what's most important. And it's bringing souls into the kingdom. It's bringing souls into Christ. So at the end of the day, it's a good thing. Well, as I've mentioned before, I've been blessed with the gift of discernment. I've been told that in my patriarchal blessing. And I feel like personally, so far in my life, up to this point where I'm at right now, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for that gift. For me, it's always a feeling that I have. I feel like there's something off about a person or with a group or an organization or even with a teaching. Something's off and it doesn't feel right. That's all it takes for me to step away and cut ties. Even when people would have me believe otherwise, even when they lay out before me all of the logic, all of the evidence that things are fine, that things are well, even when that's laid out before me, it never trumps that feeling that I have inside of me that something isn't right. And I always trust that feeling over everything else. You know, and oftentimes, most always, logic interferes with the spirit. We're taught to follow the prophet, not to follow groups, leaders of movements, scholars, leaders of other faiths. We're taught to follow the promptings of the spirit and to follow the prophet. Now you'll hear people say, no, 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 follow Jesus only. There should never be a middleman between you and the Lord. Now the adversary is very clever in selling that point. But all I have to say is that Jesus gave us prophets for a reason. They are representatives of him. They are God's mouthpiece on the earth. If we're following Christ and we truly have a testimony of him and a relationship with him, then we will know and have a testimony of the prophet and we will know that he leads Christ's church until Christ returns. And our prophet continually reminds us to keep the commandments and to repent. And if we're feeling the need to be deceptive and we're not being fully honest with those that we associate with, those that we teach, those that we minister to, then we're breaking a commandment. So then again, I ask, whose cause is it really? Because if it's the Lord's cause, it's gonna lead us to keep the commandments. It's gonna keep us on the straight and narrow covenant path. And if it's our own cause, then it's to bring us glory. It's to bring us fame, power, riches, prestige, whatever it may be. But when it's our cause, it's to bring us the glory. And when we're not serving the Lord, when we're serving ourselves, who is it that we're really serving? Now I wanna share a recent experience that I had with this to help illustrate what it is I'm talking about. A couple of months ago, a friend who lives out of state reached out to me and said that there was a couple that he had met, I think online, that had discovered my blog and he had crossed paths with them and he said to them, well, I actually know her. I know the woman who writes that blog and if you want, I could arrange a way for you to meet her and talk with her. And they said, yeah, we would love that. So he reached out to me and he said, hey, could we set up a Zoom call? Would you be interested in that? He brought up some of the topics that they wanted to talk about. And I let him know up front, this is how I feel about those topics. I don't know if that's what you wanna hear and I don't know if that's what they wanna hear. So I don't know if they're still gonna to wanna to talk to me after they know where I stand on these topics. And he thought about it for a while and he got back to me and said, no, I think, you know, you should still talk to them and, and, and I totally get where you stand and that makes sense and thanks for sharing that with me and you had some good points and, uh, you know, they still want to meet with you so let's make this happen. So we did a Zoom call 
and this couple they live in another country so we were in different time zones and the call began the things that they started talking about the things that they were so passionate about really reminded me of the Sid Roth show so I mentioned his name I brought up Sid Roth so the husband said oh I love Sid Roth I watch all of his episodes now he had told me that he had been a bishop and he had been a stake president for the area that he lives in and that he and his wife felt like he might soon be called as a stake patriarch and what he said next really troubled me he said I'm really worried if I were to ever get called as a patriarch. I'm really worried because I don't have the gift of prophecy. He said, so I made an appointment to do a Zoom call with someone this weekend who happens to be a well-known man of a different denomination who is friends with the Latter-day Saint community. And he said, I've made an appointment with this man and he's going to anoint me this weekend with the gift of prophecy so that I can finally have that gift. And he might anoint me with some other spiritual gifts and I'm super excited. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I realized that this man who had served as a bishop and a stake president didn't understand how priesthood keys work. That with callings, comes being set apart and when you're set apart and those hands are placed upon your head you are given keys to be able to carry out your calling the calling of a patriarch comes with keys and those keys unlock the gifts that you need to fulfill your calling and I'm feeling that right now I feel that that's true it's not the other way around you aren't called because you already have these gifts. You're already able to prophesy and you're a seer. So that's why you're being called to this calling. That's not how it works. You are given the keys through proper priesthood authority channels, not for men of other faiths and other denominations, but through proper channels in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, because our God is a God of order. I could see in this moment that this man was being led off the path and he didn't even realize it. And that was shocking. That was hard to hear. That was hard to see. It was like watching a train about to derail. And I just wanted to wave my arms and say, jump the train, get off the train. It's about to go off the tracks. It's about to go off the cliff. This man was leaving the path to get the gifts. That's the biggest red flag right there, is you should never have to leave the covenant path to get the gifts of the Spirit. If you find yourself having to leave the covenant path and go to these other sources, these other places, these other groups and people to get spiritual gifts from the Lord, then that's not of the Lord. The Lord teaches us to hold on to the iron rod and not let go, to stay on that covenant path and keep moving forward. Now this man wasn't seeing any of the red flags, but they were everywhere. And he started to tell me that the gift he wanted more than any other gift was the gift of speaking in tongues, or as Christians of other denominations call it, your prayer language. And his wife started to tell me, she started to say, you know what, he devotes almost his entire day to seeking after these gifts. She said he'll go into his closet and close the door and spend all day meditating in his closet, trying to have these supernatural experiences and encounters in hopes to receive these marvelous gifts of the Spirit. And she said, it's really hard because there's days when I want to go on a walk with him and he'll tell me, no, he doesn't have time for me because he's meditating so that he can have these experiences and get these gifts. And she says, I feel like it's really affecting our marriage because I feel all alone. I'm living all alone and he's off in this other world pursuing this path on his own and he has no time for me, his wife. And he started to say that he was frustrated because he was devoting so much time and effort into getting these gifts and having these experiences and they weren't happening. Yet he'd look around at all of these other people in the Christian world and some of his non-Latter-day Saint Christian friends and some of his non-Latter-day Saint friends and how they all had these gifts 
and they came just like that, no problem. And in fact, they're giving them to each other. Everyone is anointing everyone. Anyone who has these gifts can just place their hand on someone's head and just and just say, poof, you now have this gift too, I've anointed you. So everyone's walking around with this mantle or this authority and everyone's just freely giving these gifts to everybody and you don't know who's laying hands on you and, and what they're all about. And all these people are allowing other people to anoint them with these powers and gifts and everyone's getting them and having these miraculous experiences, just like everything I talked about in my October videos. That video that I did that's called Hold to the Iron Rod, and it's a three-part video series. If you haven't seen it, go look for it on my Happy Lady playlist right now on my channel. I made the series last October, and I talked about this, and I showed footage of people in these churches who freely give these spiritual gifts to each other, and they're rolling on the ground, laughing uncontrollably. I mean, a lot of that laughter sounds almost demonic. They're crawling around on all fours in their church clothes. These women in skirts and dresses crawling around on all fours. There was that man in a church suit and he had a dog leash on him and he was barking like a dog and another woman was howling like a wolf on the ground and they were all laughing and rolling around and some people were crying uncontrollably and couldn't stop. Some people were shaking and rolling around on the floor. And this went on for hours and hours and days and days and some people never snapped out of it for several days. They laid on the floors of these churches barking and acting like animals and laughing and crying and thrashing about, rolling around, some crying in pain and agony. And as, and as I showed that footage, I said, these people truly believe that these are manifestations of the Holy Spirit. They truly believe that this is from the Lord. And then I talked about that scripture in Doctrine and Covenants where the prophet Joseph had the same thing happening with the early saints of the church. And he went and prayed and went to the Lord about it. And the Lord told him in that revelation that Satan is going about the earth right now trying to deceive the hearts of men. He's going about masquerading as the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, but in reality, he's deceiving, and this is of darkness. But people are believing it's of the light, that this is all holy, and these are manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit, but in reality, it's of darkness. And so when that revelation came to Joseph, he called it out for what it was, and he put a stop to it. After that, we started seeing more order within the church. We started seeing more order in sacrament meetings. It wasn't just a free-for-all where anybody could go up and prophesy say and do whatever they wanted on and on for hours on end. But the meetings started to become more holy, more reverent. And that's one thing I have to say that I love about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the reverence that you feel, not only in the meeting houses and in the sacrament meetings, but in the temple, there's just nothing quite like it. And I think a lot of times we take that for granted and we look at these other churches having these other experiences and we see how loud and entertaining and fun and exciting it all is. The music's loud, there's bands on stage, worship bands, you've got drums and electric guitars and everyone's singing and dancing and it's so much fun and everyone's anointing everyone with these gifts and having these out of body experiences and it's just so alluring, you wanna be a part of that. And you start to look at what you have and say, well, that's kind of boring. And that's exactly what the adversary wants you to think. But having witnessed all of that, having observed all of that, and having had friends in that world, I can honestly say how much of an appreciation I have for the reverence that I feel when we sing our hymns and when we participate in our meetings, our meetings that have order and are led by the priesthood and guided by the Spirit. There's such a night and day difference. I think a lot of times people easily mistake the powerful emotions and the sensationalism of it all with the spirit. But for me, the spirit isn't loud. The spirit is a still, soft, small, quiet voice. It's something that's inside of us. It's not outward. It doesn't come from loud drums and electric guitars and singing and dancing. It comes from a quieter place inside and it's powerful. There's nothing quite like it. And I would never trade that for the other. So this man on the Zoom call, he was talking about the gift of tongues and he asked me if this was a gift that I had. And I told him, you know, 
Rather than praying in an unknown language, I prefer to pray in English. I said praying in English works just fine for me. I told them that I have experiences too personal to share, but there have been many times in my life that I have been blessed with incredible miracles just through praying in English. And not only just through praying in English in a known tongue, but through praying small and simple prayers. My prayers didn't need to be extravagant with huge vocabulary and dramatic emotion, right? They didn't need to be drawn out. They were small, they were simple, they were humble, yet they were profound. Profound enough to where the end result was great miracles and blessings. And that's been a pattern throughout my entire life as I'm sure it has been with many of you. And so in essence, I tried to say to him, why seek after a gift of speaking in an unknown language or praying in an unknown language when we can get the same results by just talking to God in a known language that we understand. And when I said that, this man looked so bewildered. It was as though he didn't know where to go from there. He didn't know where to take the conversation from that point. He could see that we were not on the same page. I don't know that my friend had told him what I had shared with them. I don't know if my friend had prepared him that my stance on all of this is probably not what they wanted to hear. That was another example of people looking beyond the mark, trying to complicate things and make them so difficult to think that you have to put so much effort and all the hours of your day into seeking after a gift that you feel you need to have. The Lord has already blessed us all with different gifts and talents that are unique that are unique to our own mission we need to be grateful for what we've already been blessed with and we need to utilize that we don't need to always be looking at the greener grass on the other side and coveting what other people have or what other people are doing. Rather than coveting other people's experiences, we need to be focused on our own personal relationship with the Lord and what he's already blessed us with. But yeah, people are always going beyond the mark, which often takes you beyond the covenant path, outside of those boundaries, outside of that protection, when it's really so simple. But people People seem to prefer complicated. Why do we complicate things? Why do we complicate the gospel? Now I just finished President Nelson's biography yesterday and as I pondered on that book, the thing that I'll take away most from that book, from President Nelson, is learning that there are times when even the prophet doesn't know the answer to some things. He has said before very directly to people who have asked, I don't know the answer to that. Now that's humility right there. And isn't it humility that we need to access the Lord's kingdom? Don't the scriptures teach us that we need to be meek and humble and lowly of heart. That's why I follow the prophet. Not scholarly people who have had dreams and have theories, but just the prophet. Now this man's wife told me she was so happy that her husband was hearing me say this. She was so happy that her husband was hearing me say, you know, really all of the stuff that you're doing is probably not the best thing you should be doing with your time. The Lord is a balance. He wants us to have balance in our lives. He wants us to devote time to Him and to also devote time to our families and our spouse. And I've noticed a lot of these other people in these groups and denominations have this almost obsession with using these gifts and accessing these gifts. That it's almost more about the gifts and the supernatural experiences than it is the Lord. And you know, sometimes we get curious, we get envious, just enough to walk off the path and go have a better look. And again, I'll repeat it. You should never have to walk off the path to get gifts of the Spirit. Simple as that. Our God is a God of order. His church is an orderly church. Okay, enough of that. So you know how I always talk about patterns and things happening and repeating that get my attention? After the last video message, there were three people who called me on the phone within 24 hours three people completely unrelated to each other. And they all said two things. They brought up energy work and they all said 
that they believe that Jesus is coming sooner than we think. Now, not only did it catch my attention that none of these ladies know each other, the other thing that really stood out to me is that I haven't talked to these ladies in years, some of them in over a decade. And some of these women have never had any interest in talking about things like this. One of the three that comes to mind, whenever I was around her, she always wanted to talk about The Bachelor and music and Hollywood and celebrities and fashion and, and things of the secular world. She never had an interest in talking about the gospel or the latter days or any of that. So for her to instigate these topics with me really said a lot. And again, all three of these women said to me, I believe that Jesus is coming sooner than we think. That's how I feel. Then, not too long after that experience, another pattern happened. Within another 24 hour period, three people messaged me who never do. And all three of these people opened up doorways to share the gospel. Some of these people don't even speak English and we've been using Google Translate to communicate with each other. And it got me thinking again about the gathering and missionary work and how these last few people that are being gathered in, and I don't believe it's a few, I actually believe it's quite a bit, but it's different than all the years before because these are people who are really hungry for the gospel. In fact, they're like the hunters. They're not waiting for the gospel to come to them and to come knocking on their door. They're actively hunting it out. They're seeking the gospel quickly and aggressively. They're really taking action. In fact, one of them is a friend that I had mentioned several videos ago earlier this year. I had mentioned a wonderful new friend I had met through my YouTube channel. She'd come across my videos and reached out to me and said, wow, you seem so happy. Maybe what I'm missing is the gospel in my life. And she wanted to learn more. She actually initiated that conversation and wanted me to help arrange for the missionaries to come see her. She lives in Arkansas. I thought that was pretty awesome. And we met over the phone and I shared with her my testimony and she asked me questions about the gospel. Um, and we've stayed friends all throughout the year. And just the other day, about a week ago, she reached out to me and she said, Lindsay, I contacted the missionaries through the church website several months ago and they still haven't come and visited me. She said, I can't wait any longer. And I had no idea that all this time she was still waiting for them to come. She said, every week I get messages. I get these nice missionary messages that come to my email once a week, but no one's actually contacted me personally and set up an appointment. And I said, well, let's take care of that. <laughs> so I was talking to my sister about this and her son is serving a mission right now in North Dakota. And she said, I bet he would love to meet with her because right now he's teaching other people in other states online because right now with the COVID situation the majority of missionary work as far as teaching the gospel is concerned is being done online and through zoom calls which allows the missionaries to reach more people and go outside of those boundaries and so she reached out to him and he said yeah we would love to meet with her and so I asked her if that would be okay and she said absolutely so she's been meeting with my nephew and his companion she lives in Arkansas he's in North Dakota and I'm in Utah and between the three of this things are happening and she's learning the gospel and during this time I had contact and I think it was the mission president and some missionary couples that I found online that are serving in that area and I reached out to all of them personally and said, I have this sweet sister who's so hungry for the gospel. She so wants to be baptized and she would love to have some missionaries come meet with her. And I didn't get a response from any of them. It wasn't until after she started meeting with my nephew and his companion that they finally contacted me back and said, yeah, here's a phone number, give this number a call. The sister missionaries who answer the phone will find some missionaries in her area. So anyways, she decided at that point that she wanted to finish the lessons with my nephew and then at that point she'll be redirected to the missionaries in her area so she can be baptized. But anyways, that was just so exciting and another example of how people right now, the final people who are being gathered in before the Lord's return, are so hungry for the gospel. They're hunting it out. 
So I had these other people reach out to me, some who don't speak English, and have also opened up the doorway for that conversation. Wanting to know what makes me so happy and what is it about my my videos and my testimony that they're so drawn to. And the simple answer is, it's the gospel. It's that light of Jesus Christ. And that was something else that I really loved about President Nelson's biography that I learned from him, is that he taught that service and learning other languages was the way to getting a foot in the door for sharing the gospel and opening up the church in other parts of the world. President Nelson would go into these difficult countries where leaders were being very difficult to work with, who didn't want the gospel in their countries. And it wasn't until he said, what is it we can do for you? Is there something that your country needs that our church can help with? And whatever it was, if it was poverty, overcrowded orphanages, whatever it was, President Nelson listened and then he followed through and sincerely, genuinely helped these countries. That's what opened up the door for the gospel. And then he showed that he truly cared and loved people and still to this day he does this by speaking to them in their own language. It shows them that he took the time and the effort to learn their language enough to teach them in their own language or greet them in their own language. There's so many opportunities that we have right now through technology online to share the gospel and teach people all over the world about Jesus Christ and the restored gospel. There's so many opportunities in so many ways that we can have an open door and when people really feel that you genuinely care about them, that you're genuinely interested in them, that you're genuinely happy, and that you're passionate about what you're happy about, when they can sense that and really feel that from you, well, that's when they want to learn more. So be passionate about the gospel. Be passionate about what you believe and live it for all the world to see because the world is such a dark place right now that your light will stand out. All those who are hungry will find the gospel through you. All right, now a little bit ago, I talked about how so many people keep telling me that they really feel that the Lord is coming sooner than we think. I feel the same way. And I've started to realize and notice how there's so many people out there who are still hanging onto all of these apostate groups and their teachings and dreams and visions. And they're waiting for certain things to still happen. They're waiting for X, Y, and Z to still happen before they can really feel that the Lord is coming soon. And as other people and I have talked about this, we've all agreed on one thing, that those people are going to miss it. If he's really coming sooner than we think, then think about right now when you think the Lord might be coming. Just think about it in your mind, well, if I had to guess and go off my feeling, I think or I feel it's in the next five years or 10 years or whatever you think, right? So think about what you think and then think it's probably sooner than that. So if he's coming sooner than we think, that truly means he's coming sooner than we think. Now remember, here's a screenshot from the church website with scriptures included. When he returns, he'll return four times. He'll return three times previous to the fourth time where he appears to the whole world. I think sometimes we forget that. About a year ago, I stopped following timelines. Even though they're fascinating, I really stopped following them because for me, it was just a feeling. I was using my feelings as a gauge rather than timelines and events. Sometimes logic interferes with the spirit. Sometimes we're looking to check off events off of timelines. And a lot of times when we do that, we can miss what's happening in the spiritual. I came across this in a lesson manual on the church website. Look at number 10. It says faithful saints, both living and dead, will be caught up to meet Christ at his coming. And I noticed how faithful saints is capitalized. Both words are capitalized, so that really stood out to me, and I felt impressed to study that more. Just who are the faithful saints? The footnote showed a reference for Doctrine and Covenants section 88. So I went there, and in that scripture, it talked about the first fruits. It said that the faithful saints are the first fruits. And there was that number, 144, a reference to the gathering of Israel. And it says in Revelation 14:4, those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes are the first fruits of God. And down below in Doctrine and Covenants section 88, 
They who shall descend with Christ are the first fruits. Then, as I read more scripture references and footnotes, it took me to the Church of the Firstborn. It said that the first fruits are those who belong to the Church of the Firstborn. So then I did a search about the Church of the Firstborn, and I came across this article on the BYU website by Ivan J. Barrett. It says the Church of the Firstborn is Christ's heavenly church, and its members are exalted beings who gain an inheritance in the highest heaven of the celestial world and for whom the family continues in eternity. And it goes on to say further down, the Church of the Firstborn is the divine patriarchal order in its eternal form, building the priesthood family order on this earth by receiving sealings in the temple is a preparation and foundation for this blessing in eternity. So according to all of this, the church of the firstborn, or the first fruits, or the faithful saints, are those who have gained a celestial inheritance through the patriarchal order of the priesthood, which can only be performed in the temples of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So this means that when the Lord returns and the faithful saints both dead and living, are caught up to meet him. This is what other Christian churches refer to as the rapture. From what I have researched, and according to Bruce R. McConkie, it is only those righteous saints who are pretty much the covenant keepers. They're the covenant makers and the covenant keepers. So those who have made covenants in the temples, those who have received those priesthood ordinances, and have qualified for a celestial inheritance. Now I have to say that this was new to me because I always thought that just all righteous people on the earth, all people who had lived good lives and believed in Christ would be caught up to meet him when he returns. But I have found now that that isn't the case, that it's the members of the church of the firstborn. It's the first fruits, the faithful saints, the covenant keepers, those who have made covenants, kept their covenants, and endured. Those are the ones who are lifted up at the last day to meet the Savior when he returns. Now this isn't to be confused with salvation because all who receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and are baptized and use his atonement and repent are saved from eternal death. But this is about exaltation. To be lifted up is to be exalted. Exaltation is being exalted or lifted up into a state of glory. That's something different than salvation, and I've talked about that in many of my videos. A lot of times people confuse them as being the same thing, but salvation and exaltation are two different matters. The path towards exaltation begins in the temple. Exaltation only happens through the ordinances in the temple. And so those who are lifted up at that last day to meet the Savior when he comes are those who have been exalted, those who have made those covenants through those priesthood ordinances and kept their covenants and endured until the last day. Those are the ones who are lifted up and exalted on high with their Savior Jesus Christ. So at this point, to bring some clarity, let's talk about the resurrection and what that looks like. The resurrection is divided into four parts and God has a plan for everyone. So I'm going to reference this article right here and I'll have a link to it down below. But this is quoted from Elder Bruce R. McConkie. Now many of us are promised in our patriarchal blessings that we will come forth and arise in the morning of the first resurrection. So just what is the morning of the first resurrection? Well, this began with Christ's resurrection, and it will continue in and through the millennium. This resurrection is reserved for those who have lived righteously. It's reserved for those who are destined to be heirs of the celestial kingdom. Those who were on the covenant path and who have stayed on that covenant path and endured until the last day. Next is the afternoon of the first resurrection. So when Christ comes on that glorious morning, all those who are the first fruits are lifted up 
and exalted to meet him at his coming, and they get to descend with him. Later on in the afternoon is part two of that resurrection. It's called the afternoon of the first resurrection. This resurrection starts once the millennium has begun and will carry on throughout the thousand years of the millennium. It's reserved for those who have lived good lives but were not necessarily valiant. This resurrection is reserved for those who are destined to inherit the terrestrial kingdom. So this can even include those who have been on the covenant path before, who made covenants but were not valiant in keeping them and enduring until the end. This would also include all people, believers and non-believers, who lived good lives and kept the commandments. Now these are all the people who live during the millennium. Next, we have the morning of the second resurrection. This resurrection begins at the end of the millennium. It's reserved for those who have lived sinful lives, for those who have lived contrary to the dictates for their conscience and the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Those who come forth in this resurrection will inherit the telestial kingdom, the lowest of the three degrees of glory. Those who inherit this glory will not spend eternity in the presence of Satan and his minions. However, they will be eternally shut out of the presence of God and Christ. But how merciful is our God to exalt them to a state of glory. This tells us just how much he loves all his children. And last is the afternoon of the second resurrection. This resurrection will take place after all others have been resurrected. It's reserved for the sons and daughters of perdition, for those who will spend eternity with the devil and his angels because immortality they did the work of the devil and his angels. It is the only one of the four resurrections that provides its recipients with no glory whatsoever. Therefore, the eternal abode for those who come forth in this resurrection is known as outer darkness. It's what the rest of the world calls hell. This is where God's light never shines. So let's go back and talk about those of the telestial world, those who get a telestial glory, those who are resurrected at the end of the millennium, they will not get to experience the presence of God or Jesus Christ. They will be shut out from that presence, but they will still get to live in that light. And it's those of outer darkness who live in a place for eternity where God's light never shines. So the morning of the first resurrection is what we should all be shooting for. That should be our highest goal. That should be what gets us out of bed every morning and keeps us on our knees all day. That should be what keeps us always in a state of repentance. This is why, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we are gathering Israel. This is why we're sharing this message with the entire world, because it's an invitation for everyone to partake of this, for everyone to come unto him and be lifted up at the last day. Anyways, just had to share that. Okay, let's go ahead. I just want to share some screenshots with you real quick before we wrap up. I took this screenshot after my last video, number 140, it's midnight, and there are both of those numbers, 113 and the 11th hour. Just another witness to pay attention. There's that number again, third day power in this 11th hour. On my video, it's midnight. And just like always, I see it every day. Here's 113, which to me is always a representation of the family and family history. And of course, it's on a video that I sent of my family. Then there's the infamous number 666, which we did talk about in today's video message. And it's just interesting that it was on this video, the All-American Rejects. Those words stood out to me, American and reject. And I thought those who reject what America is all about, those who reject that are part of that system of the beast. Now these screenshots are always just minutes and sometimes seconds apart. 
but the same day after seeing all these numbers, here it is again, 144, the gathering of Israel, on a video uh, of my children. It's a pay attention number, a reminder that they are a part of that special generation held in reserve for this time. Here it is again, 144, but it's backwards. This is on my Come Follow Me primary video, which was all about scripture power. Again, another witness of and reference to this generation held in reserve for this time. They are a special generation. Here's 113, the family. And this is on our video all about our family and what we did in July. Now the number 23 and 11 go together. 11 is 11 o'clock p.m. right before midnight and 23 is the 23rd hour of the day right before midnight. And of course we went camping and the only spot they had available for us was spot number 23. There was that number. Then we went to Bear Lake and the number of the condo that we stayed in was number 111. It's another number that we see all the time and it always reminds me of unity, being one with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And also you have 11 in there, another reminder of the 11th hour. Went shopping for some Tide Febreze. <laughs> there was that number again, 144, the gathering of Israel. To me, that means gather Israel right now. Make that your highest priority. It's missionary work on both sides of the veil. A friend of mine texted this to me. A friend of hers posted this on Facebook. You can see in the picture, there's the three male deer and the number 113. And there again, the family, but also the males. You also have three males. It reminds me of the Godhead or the first presidency. Now this friend of mine has 33 often as a pay attention number. Then another one of her friends posted this on Facebook, a picture of two deer in her yard, both male deer. And again, there's the number 33 on the screenshot. It doesn't get more random, yet more of a pattern or pay attention than that. As we talked about the symbolism in this, she said the word stag stood out to her. So I looked up stag, and of course you have a male deer, but check out the second definition, a social gathering attended by men only, a stag event. So we got thinking about that, and I thought, well, this kind of sounds like a priesthood meeting, a special meeting involving priesthood leaders or patriarchs having to do with the gathering of the eternal family, the 113, something that we hold very dear to us, D-E-E-R. So those words stood out to me. So I decided to break this down, and because the number 33 was on both of those screenshots of the male deer, the stags, I had the impression to go to section 33 in the Doctrine and Covenants, not knowing what this section was about. It says laborers are called to declare the gospel in the 11th hour. There it is, you guys. And then it says the church is established and the elect are to be gathered. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The church is built upon the gospel rock. Prepare for the coming of the bridegroom. So then, this priesthood meeting, or stag event, an event just for men, but a special event, a special gathering, made me think of Adam on Diamond. That immediately came into my mind. So I did a quick search on the Gospel app in my scriptures, and this is what came up, section 107. Right there is the date, November 11th. 11 11 there it is again and it says that this was revelation on the priesthood given through joseph smith on this date so here we have something about the priesthood with the number 11 and it says as we scroll down the patriarchal order is established from adam to noah ancient saints assembled at adam on diamon and the lord appeared to them and we know, I talked about this in this video, 
that the Lord will return four times, three times before his fourth final appearance to the whole world. The very first time that he appears again prior to his grand second coming is he will appear at the council of Adam on Diamond. This great council will take place prior to the second coming. So this is something that should be happening very soon. And it's funny that that's what came into my mind when I saw that picture of the male deer at that priesthood, special event, special gathering, special meeting. And here it is. And it says here that we are taught that Adam on Diamon, which is located in Davies County, Missouri, I actually got to visit there last year. It's a beautiful, peaceful, sacred site. We learn that this site is where Adam and Eve lived after being expelled from the Garden of Eden. And we're taught that it will be a gathering spot. There it is, gathering for a meeting of the priesthood leadership, including prophets of all ages and other righteous people prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Here's that number again, 144, this time on a YouTube video. It says, get ready. Something big is about to happen, overflowing blessings. And here's the number 311 under subscribers. If you look down below next to subscribers, it says 3.11 thousand. Here it is on a video about corruption being exposed. Pay attention. My sister texted me. She said, lots of thunder down here right now. And she sent it at 311. <laughs> 311. There it was. Pay attention. Things are happening. Well, the very next day in the evening, we had a thunderstorm come through. So I quickly texted her, yay, we have rain, wind, and a thunderstorm. And it happened to be at 11.13 p.m. I noticed that later. There it is, 113 and 311 in reverse. And speaking of thunderstorms and lightning, here's that screenshot of California and the 11,000 lightning strikes in three days. 11, 3, there's that 311. And then 11,000 views. Then a couple nights ago, we had this beautiful double rainbow over the backyard. And my daughter said, Mom, Mom, you know why it's a double rainbow? The number two stands for the second coming. It's the second time Jesus is coming. He's coming soon. She was so excited to tell me that. I just had to share. And last, this was shared on Facebook. So I took a screenshot. It says, Apostle Jeffrey R. Holland's alarming declaration. This was in March of 2015. Just a quick quote for you tonight, which comes from last October 14th at a Utah State Conference. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland, who was well known for speaking the blatant truth with the fire of the Spirit, said this, All will never be the same. From this time forward, everything will be new. Our government may fall, our finances may fall, the nation may fall, but do not fear. The church will stand and remain strong. Those of you with wayward children, I give you my blessing to prepare. Your children will be returning home. There will be new revelations. From this time forward, you will hear things you have never heard before. See things you have never seen before and your leaders will ask what they have never asked before. We, the apostles, will not be attending state conferences anymore. We are called to other things now. All you know will never be the same. How prophetic was that? That was in 2015, and this is coming to pass right now in 2020. Anyways, the message I hope you take away from this video today is that the Lord is coming soon. And because of that, Satan is going to do everything he can right now to distract us, confuse us, and get us to step off of that covenant path. But we don't have to worry about that if we're looking to the prophet, if we're following him, if we're looking straight ahead and holding onto that iron rod and staying on that covenant path and surrounding ourselves with other covenant keepers who are also following the prophet. We can find safety in that. Things are happening really fast on the earth right now. I think we all can feel that. That's no surprise. And it all points to 
the Lord coming soon. Let's not waste these final seconds that we're in. Repent, repent, repent of anything that you have in your life that's keeping you away from the Lord or distracting you from your covenant. Strengthen your families, fortify your marriages and your homes. Serve, 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 serve and minister humble yourselves. Stop focusing on building your own empire and getting gain, but focus on all the things you need to get out of your life and get rid of and simplify and cut back on to make room for the Lord. By doing this, you will be blessed. Anyways, thank you so much for joining me today, you guys. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I hope you have a wonderful week, and I will see you next time.